Hello there, my friends. Um, I do apologize again about all the craziness that's been happening. Um, I think uh, dentists uh, broke the internet with the amount of webinars that are out there. But um, again, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, hopefully this works, what we're trying to do right now. Uh, my name is Ehab Musa, and the topic I'm going to share with all of you today is an hour of soft tissue management for implants. So, uh, as I previously said, I'm originally from Alexandria, Egypt. Um, this is where I grew up. This is where I did dental school. Um, I joined my father in his practice after finishing. He's a prosthodontist. Um, he taught me everything I know, Wahi Musa. Um, I've watched him do implants, um, you know, even before going to dental school. And from watching him, um, I traveled with him once to uh, Case Western Reserve where he teaches the Perry residents over there and then I saw those Perry residents and I was like you know what I want to be like these guys I want to learn the way they're learning so I joined um, the fellowship program over there first then moved on to the residency program uh, following finishing residency I felt that you know I was kind of restoratively ignorant and so I thought I, I want to do a one-year fellowship in uh, implant prosthodontics and that's what brought me to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. That was at LSU University. Um, currently I live in New Orleans. I'm in private practice uh, over here. Obviously not at this point in time. Um, but I've, I've been thankful. You know, I'm thankful and I've been blessed uh, to be able to practice um, another passion of mine, which is lecturing and teaching. Um, I've had some great mentors along the way, Maurice Salama, Howie Gluckman, um, Isaac Towell, just a whole lot of people, Chuck Schwimmer, I can't, I can't name all of them, Sinjana, and so yes, I have been uh, very blessed um, to grow up uh, in the dental world uh, knowing people like these. And you know, if you haven't been to Egypt or New Orleans, uh, really nice places to visit. Hopefully after all uh, what we're in right now is over, uh, you can consider one of those places as a destination. Uh, Egypt has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Um, New Orleans is probably the most unique city um, I've ever been in the United States. So yeah, both of them are definitely places to visit. But yes, right now it's a very, very unique time. and. Um, you know, we went through something that was not similar, but kind of similar, which was the revolution uh, in Egypt. But definitely, this is uh, this is much different. The whole world is pretty much in the same boat. And like I was saying, uh, it's very easy to uh, be dragged into the negative train of thought and to be looking at everything in a negative way in these times. Um, but I feel there's a few things that we can do to help us, you know, just trying to be positive, exercising, um, trying to knock some stuff out, out of that checklist that we've, you know, had for years and years. Um, and just trying to better ourselves, you know, in whatever way we can. And we're very um, lucky that even though, you know, we're all passionate about dentistry and, you know, we're all, you know, bummed that we can't practice dentistry but we live in a day and age that you know there's so many dental webinars online so much discussion so much free information um, and that's that that's really something that we should be thankful for and so when I think of soft tissue surgery um, to me this is really the soft tissue surgery around implants to me this is really the most innovative part um, of implant dentistry. It's the part that I enjoy the most. I think it's something that um, you can be very creative in doing. Yes, we do have a lot of techniques, a lot of basic techniques that we've been taught through the classic literature. But uh, as Howie uh, Gluckman says, uh, this is an area where you can innovate on the fly. You know, you can combine those procedures, you can modify those procedures, and so it's really a fun area of implant dentistry. Uh, but with that said, I do feel it's a very overlooked area in implant dentistry. And sure, you can look at the case on the screen and we can talk about ideology. Sure, 
you can say that there's many factors that may be involved here. It's not, I'm not saying that the, the reason or the, the cause of this patient being the way he is right now is, you know, because there wasn't any uh, granitized gingiva or anything like that. No, there's many causes. Uh, Periimplantitis, occlusion, uh, implant placement error, you know, we don't know where these implants were placed. We don't know what the patient was doing at home in terms of hygiene. But what I'd like to focus on for uh, today's presentation is the last point, which is insufficient soft tissue volume and quality. And actually, um, in my own practice, I see a lot of cases that have been recently done, patients coming in with cases that have been done like a year ago or a few months ago, and when you look at the soft tissues around those implants, you see that they're missing either quality or quantity or possibly even both. And I feel that this is definitely a risk factor for recession, for bone loss, for cases like you see on the screen here. And I'm not saying that it's um, negligence from uh, you know dentists uh, dentist side, but we only we see only what we know and I feel that there is a ton of implant courses out there there's a ton of implant education but again I feel that soft tissue surgery is one area that is highly overlooked and so for the rest of this presentation my outline is basically going to be we're gonna talk just a little bit about anatomy and terminology um, we're gonna look at the factors that you should be looking at um, soft tissue wise in any implant case then we're gonna classify those defects according to the factors that we find then we're gonna talk a little bit about timing of soft tissue grafting and finally we're gonna go through some clinical cases that kinda of shows how to implement all those previous practice, uh, factors in clinical practice so we look at the anatomy and this you know it's very basic information but what I'd like to point um, out on the slide and really that's the key in, in, in everything is on the right hand side you see an implant to the left of it you see a tooth we see that we have connective tissue fibers um, between the gingiva and the tooth on the left side while on the right side there is no connective tissue fibers going from the gingiva to the implant and so implants lack a connective tissue attachment and that is what makes both of these totally different animals you know and it has a lot of impact on soft tissue surgery especially on the left hand side you see a diagram that shows the attached gingiva the alveolar mucosa um, not all keratinized gingiva is attached um, and really what we're looking for in all these surgeries and all these procedures is attached gingiva um, these are three terms that we're going to be talking about a lot. Gingival thickness, gingival width, vestibular depth. Um, but just really quickly, uh, gingival thickness, you know, you have horizontal thickness and you have vertical thickness. Here you see a line outlining the horizontal thickness, which starts from the implant platform uh, to the gingiva, minus obviously the width of bone that would be underneath here. When we talk about gingival width, which is really keratinized gingiva width. Um, this is what we're looking at, what you see on the screen right now. And the third term is going to be vestibular depth. And obviously, we, we all know about vestibular depth, but these three terms um, I'm going to be mentioning a lot throughout this presentation. And so, before going into the factors, the diagnostic factors that we need to look at, I'd like to first talk about when we should be looking at those diagnostic factors. Here you see a flow chart that kind of shows um, how I personally go through analyzing um, implant cases, in particular implant deficient sites. So we first, first thing we do is we analyze the soft tissue, okay? Um, is the soft tissue of adequate quantity and quality that would allow me to perform a heart tissue procedure? or do I need to intervene first and perform a soft tissue augmentation? We then go through the heart tissue augmentation, implant placement, and then the second time we analyze the soft tissue is at the second stage. And I feel second stage surgery 
is another overlooked factor in implant dentistry. Actually, I feel second stage surgery is probably one of the most important steps when we're talking about implant dentistry. So at this point in time, we again look at the soft tissues. What's the quantity? What's the quality? Where do I need to add if I need to add it? can range from anything as simple as a punch incision to something as complex as, you know, a lingually positioned flap with a free gingival graft. And so these are the two uh, points in time where we really need to look at the soft tissue, stage one and stage six. Now we look at the factors that we have to analyze when we're looking at soft tissue. First of all, and um, you know, this is really more of a bone problem than it is soft tissue, but as we have been taught by uh, Team Atlanta, it's the attachment levels on the neighboring teeth. You know, is this really a case that can be fixed with regenerative therapy? Or is it a case that may require, for example, orthoextrusion? Second thing is vestibular depth. You know, when we're looking at these cases, whether before bone grafting or at second stage, what's the vestibular depth? How can I solve this issue? For sure, I can't let this patient walk out with his lip uh, attached almost to the crest of the ridge. What's the KG width? How much keratinized gingiva do I have? And we know from the literature now that there's no question about it. You need, you need two millimeters of keratinized gingiva on the buckle and probably another two millimeters on the lingual. And also you need thickness. So what's the biotype? You know, is it something that we need to change? Do we need to add a, some sort of tissue graft to increase the thickness? What's the soft tissue volume? That's another important factor before uh, performing regenerative uh, bone augmentation procedures. Do we have an adequate volume to cover those regenerative materials or not? And we'll show cases later on. Scarring and clefting are another two important factors, especially to assess before uh, doing any bone grafting procedures. These are probably things that have to be addressed first so that you can set yourself up for success in bone grafting procedures. So based on the factors that we're looking at now, um, this is a very simple classification for soft tissue defects that I feel works, um, works, works well for me in my own private practice. We're looking at quantitative deficiencies and qualitative deficiencies. Obviously, quantitative deficiencies, it's volume associated, and qualitative deficiencies is associated with quality. And we, we have uh, also combined defects, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. So quantitative deficiencies, you're missing volume. Whether you're missing volume horizontally, as you see on the left photo here, or whether you're missing volume vertically, which is, con which is considered gingival recession. Um, both of these fit within the realm of uh, quantitative deficiencies. And when we look at quantitative deficiencies, this is really more of a bone problem rather than it is a soft tissue problem you probably don't have a lot of buckle bone on that implant on the top left here. Obviously, the implant on the bottom does not have any bone on the buckle at all. So although this is a bone problem, we can very often fix it with soft tissue. And when we look at the implant uh, on the top left here, thin tissues over implant is really a risk factor for gingival recession. But it is much more predictable to treat cases like this um, at this point in time, it's much more predictable to augment thickness than it is to cover gingival recession. When we talk about qualitative deficiencies, here we're missing um, quality of tissue. Here you can see this, this patient's uh, cheek is pretty much attached to his healing abutments. The patient on the right hand side, you can see that when I pull the cheek, it moves all the way to the gingival margin on the implant. And that movement, again, remember implants don't have a connective tissue seal, so we need attached gingiva. That movement, when I pull the cheek, it allows the plaque, it moves the gingival margin, and it allows the plaque to um, go in there into the sulcus um, around the implant. So again, uh, qualitative deficiencies, the key here is that implants lack a connective tissue attachment. And so we need to have adequate attached gingiva around those implants to act as a soft tissue seal. 
but actually in clinical reality most cases will present as combined deficiencies and that's that's in most clinical cases on the left hand side you see a site that is deficient in width volume is missing but at the same time look at where the mucogingival junction is so it's both we're missing quality and quantity on the right hand side it's the same thing we're missing volume on the buckle of this implant and you can see here the muscle pull that we have in the very um, shallow vestibule. And so that pretty much uh, sums up soft tissue defects. Quantitative, qualitative, and combined defects. I'm going to be mentioning those terms a lot um, throughout the remainder of this presentation. And so we have to know what are we trying to improve. Are we trying to improve the quality? Are we trying to improve the quantity or are we trying to improve both? Because when we know what we're trying to achieve, then we can accurately, based on that, choose the correct technique that we can apply um, in our cases. And, you know, these are just some of the techniques that um, I utilize in clinical practice. And there's other techniques, of course, that are not listed here. But then, you know, once you decide on what you're trying to improve, then you can choose that particular technique. The next question is, when are you going to apply this technique? At which stage of treatment are you going to perform the soft tissue surgery? And when we look at timing of soft tissue grafting, and to me really this is one of the most important slides of this presentation, you have four, four chances of performing your soft tissue graft. First one is before implant placement or even before bone augmentation procedure. Second one is when you're grafting soft tissue at the time of implant placement. Third option is grafting at second stage surgery. And obviously the fourth option is grafting post restoration. And at this point in time, it's considered a complication. Um, personally, my preference is to perform most of my soft, soft tissue grafting at second stage surgery but I will show cases where you have to perform the graft before even the, the bone augmentation procedure. And uh, my goal for the remainder of this presentation is to go through some clinical cases. Obviously, I won't be able to cover um, everything related to soft tissue management around implants, but I'm going to go through some clinical cases that outline um, when and why you should graft soft tissue before uh, implant placement or before augmentation, when you can do it at the same time as implant placement, when can you do it at stage two, and lastly we're going to see um, one case where we did it um, as a complication treatment. So let's go to the first case that we have. Um, this is a patient that presented to me with um, implants in the lateral and canine, size, and canine position Implants have been in there for 20 plus years. Um, all those four implants uh, on the laterals and canines lack buccal bone. But on the left hand side, these implants lack interproximal bone are, and are both if, and are basically failing. And here you can see that we can probe pretty much all the way down uh, to the apex of the implant. Here you see removing these implants and um, removing these didn't really take much effort. Uh, I just basically pulled them out. Um, but the, the question is here, after we remove these implants, what do we do? You know, I can tell you that there is a, a very large vertical bone deficiency that lies below that, that we're going to have to treat with a bone augmentation procedure. So at this point in time, what do we do? Do we perform the bone augmentation at the same time as implant removal? Obviously not, because we're already missing a lot of soft tissue volume, and we're going to try to advance our flaps to compensate for the loss of that soft tissue volume and also to cover the bone graft that we're going to put in. The second option would be to take the implants out, let that um, soft tissue heal, and then come back uh, and, and uh, perform the bone augmentation procedure. And here you can see... Um, this is what it looks like, what the bone defect looks like. So again, we've talked about two options, um, which is basically taking the implant out and just letting the soft tissue heal. What about a third option? 
third option would be taking those implants out, um, grafting with a connective tissue graft or a t rotated pedicle, basically adding tissue volume. So what's the benefit in that? Let me take those two photos that you see in front of you here and kind of overlay them against each other, okay? So this is pretty much what it looks like when we overlay those two photos against each other. Then I'm going to draw a line um, along the buccal uh, border of this vertical defect. Okay, so there's two components, a buccal and a palatal. I'm going to draw a line along the buccal. And then I'm going to take the same line and overlay it over the clinical soft tissue um, photo. As we've been traditionally taught, soft tissue follows the bone right so if I take these implants out and I give time for the soft tissue to heal more than likely the soft tissue is gonna follow the architecture of the bone that you see here however I am trying to grow bone or when I go back in to do my bone graft procedure I will be trying to grow bone down to the level where you see this line is at so if I let the soft tissue heal um, following the current defect topography again I'm gonna be starting out on the negative I need to take the soft tissue from where it's at at that dotted line and advance it to cover regenerative materials that extend up to that line that you see on the bottom of the photo so here I would like to talk a little bit about the the benefit of adding a soft tissue graft versus uh, letting the soft tissue heal on its own okay so what I ended up doing in this case, I took the implants out, we rotated a palatal pedicle, as you can see in this photo. We then take that palatal pedicle and we suture it to the neighboring uh, tissues. And again, we're not advancing anything. We're not mobilizing that buccal flap. We're not messing with the mucogingival junction. We're just basically sealing the hole. And this is how it heals. You know, here you can see um, an occlusal uh, photo of the, how this heals. But look at this photo. This, this here is pretty interesting, and this is what I mean. The soft tissue, when we, do, uh, when, when we do it in this manner, the soft tissue does not follow the bone. We actually have an excess of soft tissue here compared to where the bone is at. And that will really help us out and will work in our favor when we go in to do the bone augmentation procedure, as, as I'll show in the next slide. So here we see the bone, uh, the bone defect, uh, pretty much a, a moderate to severe vertical defect, but we have good interproximal height of bone, so we're using titanium mesh and autogenous bone from the ramus to treat this case. We cover everything with PRF, but here's where I'd like to point your attention. Notice that in my flap design, I only have one vertical incision on the distal. So usually in a case like this, if I'm trying to grow that much bone vertically, I usually need two verticals so that I can advance my flap as much as I need. But having the excess tissue there allows me to be more conservative with my flap design and only have one vertical distally, and yet I'm still able to close my flap predictably. And here you can see the healing. Healing is pretty peaceful, no issues. And another important benefit of doing the soft tissue grafting as we did in this case, look at the where the mucogingival junction is on the healed photo towards the right hand side. We didn't um, jack up that mucogingival line to the crest of the ridge. You know, mucogingival line still looks pretty good on the buckle. And what that helps us out in that at the time when I go back in to do the second stage surgery in this case, I don't have to do that much. You know, I don't have to worry about apically positioned flaps, vestibuloplasties, or using free gingival grafts in the aesthetic zone. So this is pretty much um, why I prefer, um, in, in a lot of cases, doing soft tissue grafting before uh, the bone augmentation procedure. Moving on to a case where we perform the soft tissue grafting at the same time as the implant placement. So this is a case where tooth was taken out, rich preservation was done. Um, less than adequate result was achieved as with most bridge preservations but when we look at a case like this we can pretty much we have enough bone to place our implant um, but and that's a good point in, in the discussion here personally 
Um, when we're talking about implants in the aesthetic zone, um, if I was to try and simplify things as much as possible, for me it's either using partial extraction therapy or soft tissue grafting at the same time. So for me it's, it's either one or the other. We're either doing partial extraction therapy or we're adding a soft tissue graft when it's in the aesthetic zone. So here you see the implant placed. Um, part of the implant surface is um, outside the bone. So we're going to perform a GBR procedure with a resorbable barrier and cover that with a connective tissue graft. Here you see periosteal sutures. Um, you can do these in a vertical or horizontal fashion. But the most important thing on this slide here is the position of the connective tissue graft. You really want that graft to be at that crestolabial line angle. Because sometimes if you position that graft a little bit too apical, it gives you thickness, but it get, doesn't give you thickness where you want it, and it can look ugly. So that's where we're aiming for, that crestolabial line angle. We suture everything up, and this is how it heals on the right-hand side. We have good volume here. When you look at this photo, there's good volume. But we may have to do a little something to um, treat the quality of the tissue. We have mucosa that's creeping up towards the crest of the ridge. And so for second stage, we do something that's very simple. We're doing basically taking the mucosa. We're using an apically positioned flap to basically push that mucosa apically and suture it apically so that we uncover our connective tissue graft and it keratinizes. And at the same time, we're provisionalizing the case to start shaping the profile. Here you can see the final soft tissue profile. And when it comes to that thickness that you see on the buckle, um, I attribute that to the connective tissue graft, not the GBR. Connective tissue grafts are so much more reliable in adding thickness compared to bone, in my opinion. And here you see the final result for the case. Um, again, you see the emergence profile. Uh, for me, honestly, it's very hard to obtain a nice emergence profile without having uh, the adequate soft tissue volume. Moving on to another case, uh, now we're looking at second stage surgery, okay? Uh, not really second stage surgery, but this is a patient that I actually treated in residency. Um, she came in and she had four failing incisors. Uh, we took four of them out. We placed two implants to restore her with an implant with an implant supported bridge. And here, and then we uh, placed the implants. She disappeared for about maybe six, seven months. And when she came back, this is what she looked like. These two implants I placed, I placed at the same time, but you can see that there's a considerable difference in the way both of these healed. And I'm sure most of you already know that the implant on the right-hand side was treated with partial extraction therapy, while the implant on the left-hand side was a traditional immediate. So there's no way that I'm letting this patient uh, go back to her restorative dentist with uh, the implant in the left-hand side looking the way it is. And so I tell the patient, you know what, I think that we need to do something about that implant, and let's try and perform a soft tissue graft to bulk that out. Excuse me with the sound in the background. So we go to the tuberosity, and we pretty much harvest the entire tuberosity here. And then we're taking that tuberosity graft, and we're folding it over each other to increase the thickness. We're suturing it here with 4-O-chromic gut. And then we go uh, to the site, and we're going to augment thickness here. And we're using a Vista-style incision. Um, this, was a, this was a Vista incision done with a partial thickness incision. That's not how I do it anymore. Uh, currently, I use a full thickness uh, type of design. But again, we access it. We form the tunnel, and we're using a suture to pull the soft tissue graft in place. And this is how it looks like when it heals. And so, you know, I was in residency. You know, you can't get enough surgery. And so I tell this patient, you know what, it looks good, but I think it can look better. So what do you think about doing another soft tissue graft? And the patient was actually OK with that. And part of that was because the first harvest was from the tuberosity, which is, has much less pain compared to going to the palate. And so she agreed to go into a second soft tissue graft. This time, 
I changed the way I accessed it. Again, another tunnel, just a, a different entry point. So we do like a stab incision in the vestibule. We tunnel through that. And here you see um, basically this suture um, has our graft sutured in place where we want it, which is right at the crest, right at that crestal labial line angle. And this is how we finish the case. Um, and just one thing to point out here, you know, I did two soft tissue grafts on the implant on the left hand side, um, zero soft tissue grafts on the implant on the right hand side, and it still looks better because of partial extraction therapy, but this is a topic for another presentation. And here you can see the pre and post uh, for this case right here. Now, going into um, second stage surgery, also, but here we're going to be looking at qualitative deficiencies. We've showed a couple of cases where we were missing quantity, but now let, let's look at some cases where we're missing quality. So this is a patient that presented to me, this was a referral case, and uh, this patient is lacking bone in the posterior mandible horizontally and vertically. Uh, you can see that before we start, he doesn't have that much kg to work with. But not having a lot of keratinized gingiva is not really a problem for me uh, when doing bone augmentation procedures. I'm more looking for biotype. I'm more looking for vestibular depth. I would rather fix the issue of keratinized gingiva at second stage when I can visualize where I need to add the keratinized gingiva, whether it's at the crest, whether it's at the labial, whether it's at the lingual. So here you see the defect. We go ahead and treat this with a titanium mesh, uh, vertical and horizontal augmentation. We're using autogenous bone from the ramus in this case. And then we layer everything with a collagen membrane, uh, PRF membranes over that, and obviously a tension-free closure, which is key in all bone grafts uh, that we perform. And then we wait about six months for a case like this. When we go back in, the um, result looks, you know, we have adequate bone formation. We're missing a little. Um, we had a little soft tissue invagination in the anterior part of the augmentation. But again, we were still able to place the implants. We did a uh, veneer graft in this case uh, over those implants, but that's not really our topic. And, you know, these implants heal. And uh, now it's time for second stage. Okay. So we look at a case like this, we have, we pretty much have less keratinized gingiva compared to what this patient started with. And that we can attribute also to surgerizing the area. Every time we do surgery, every time we do surgery, the tissues shrink, keratinized gingiva width decreases. And when we look at what we have here, uh, there, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of options on how we can treat this. Um, Personally, I would feel um, anxious about trying to split that keratinized gingiva and splitting it between the buccal and lingual. I just find that this is too narrow. And my goal when this patient is leaving my office, when he's going to his, his restorative dentist, my goal is to overbuild and overbulk the sites because that's what, implant, what implants need. We need excess tissue volume, excess tissue quality. So this is just too narrow to split. Another option may be um, that we do a free gingival graft first, let that heal, and then go back and split the width of the free gingival graft. But then we're actually doing two procedures now because one is the free gingival graft and the second is the second stage surgery. Um, another option, which uh, is a technique that we're currently working on publishing, is that we're going to take that width of kg that you see on the screen and we're going to move that to the lingual aspect of the implants. Okay, So all the keratinized gingiva that was there is going to be moved to the lingual aspect of the implants. On the buccal side of the implants, uh, our incision actually starts at the buccal uh, mucogingival junction. So our flap on the buccal does not include any keratinized gingiva. We're doing an an apically positioned flap. The, here you see the periosteum on the buccal um, uncovered. The keratinized gingiva is to the lingual of the implants. We uncover the implants, attach the healing abutments, 
and we suture a free gingival graft over that buccal periosteal bed that we've prepared. And so essentially, in one procedure, what we're trying to do is augment KG on the buccal and on the lingual, while at the same time uncovering the implants. We used the width that was there for the lingual aspect, we moved it to the lingual, we attached our healing abutments, and we're grafting the buccal with the free gingival graft. And here you can see uh, how this area heals. And you see that we have adequate attached gingiva on the buccal and on the lingual aspect of those implants. Well, what about cases where you have even a narrower zone of keratinized gingiva? This patient right here, we had treated with uh, a bone reduction procedure, uh, placed four implants, and he's going to be restored with an overdenture. But you look at the KG width here, and you see that in some areas, it's actually almost non-existent. So this is a case that I cannot manage in the same manner that I showed in the previous slide. And on top of that, we look and we see we have a very strong lingual frenum that extends uh, up to the crest of the ridge. And so um, another way of managing these cases is a two-stage approach. And this is something that I've, uh, I've seen uh, first, actually, from uh, Radoslav Jarosz, uh, who is a fantastic surgeon, really. But uh, as a first step, we're doing a vestibuloplasty procedure on the buckle. And then all of this is a periosteal bed that we've uncovered. There's no loose fibers on that. Obviously, um, knowing where our mental foramina uh, are and, you know, doing the surgery accordingly to that. Then we go to the palate. Not really the palate here. This patient had an is edentulous on the maxilla. So there's really no reason for me to go to the palate. I can just harvest everything I need from the edentulous ridge which is much less painful. As you go deeper into the palate, as you go more towards the midline, it starts hurting more. So according to Zucchelli, the two main things that cause pain when harvesting grafts is the more you go towards the midline, the more painful it is. And obviously the thicker graft you harvest, the more painful it is. So here we're trying to keep our thickness at about a millimeter and a half. And yes, I, I'm going to need something longer than this, but there's no reason to go to the other side of the palate. I can simply harvest one graft and then split it and suture it in position. Okay, so this is the first procedure. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a, a photo of how this healed before uh, surgerizing the case for second stage. But here you can see that after this heals, I basically have enough keratinized gingiva on the buccal aspect of the implants, so I don't need to touch that. But I also have keratinized gingival on the crestal aspect of the ridge. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to move the KG that's on the crest of the ridge, I'm going to move that to the lingual of those implants. And so here you see we're starting a lingually positioned flap, and when you're doing those lingually positioned flaps, it's very important um, to be partial thickness at the crest of the ridge. It's, it's really important to leave some periosteum to suture to, but as we go deeper, um, we're using semi-blunt dissection. We're using a periosteal elevator just to move those muscle fibers down. And here you can see the lingual flap mobilized on the right-hand side. We suture everything up. Uh, this is 6-0 nylon. This is pretty much my favorite suture um, to use in uh, soft tissue grafting cases. And this is how it heals up. This is about four weeks post-op. And here you can see a two-year post-op uh, for this case. And again, two years is not much, but everything looks like it's pretty much uh, staying the way it is. And, you know, I feel that especially in those full arch cases, we really have to pay extra attention to uh, the soft tissue um, profile that these patients leave with. Now moving on to our last case, and this is an example of, um, now that we're treating a case after it's restored, this is really considered a complication, okay? And this patient presents, she'd had this implant since she was a young girl. Um, she's starting to notice that the gums look different, it kind of looks gray, the tooth looks longer than it was before, and so she 
when we take a closer look, and she has a high smile line, which really complicates things, but when we take a closer look, she has a little bit of gingival recession um, on the crown. But when we look at the occlusal photo, you can see that there's a, this is a volume issue. Okay, we're missing um, a lot of soft tissue volume, and this is actually due to uh, bone loss. This implant pretty much has no bone on the buckle. Sorry, I don't have the CT here, but this implant pretty much has no bone on the buckle. And the way we manage these cases is really, really very critical. Um, and I think that one uh, protocol that has been working for me kind of pretty well uh, in the past few cases, and I'll share, I'll share that protocol with you in the next few slides, but we're basically here trying to do two things. We want to augment thickness. We want to give more thickness here to be more resistant to recession. But at the same time, if we can cover some of that recession, um, it's, it's not going to hurt. So this is not from the same case, but this is just to demonstrate uh, the process. So we do a, vis a single vertical incision, a vista incision, and through that incision, we do a full thickness access. And it's very, very important that our tunnel um, extends all the way down so that we can mobilize these papilla and we can mobilize this gingival margin. You see on the photo on the right, I'm using my uh, tunneling instruments here to push the papillae and the gingival margin down. And that is really, really critical because this is where we need to augment, right at that crestal, uh, crestal labial line angle. Obviously a connective tissue graft, I rarely use, uh, if, if ever, any um, ADM or anything like that with implants, it's always autogenous tissue. Graft is inserted into the tunnel. And then we're using uh, double cross sutures to mobilize everything. The papilla on the right hand side had a very, very, uh, the papilla, sorry, on the distal of the implant had a very weak attachment with the palatal. <clears throat> but um, this is my preferred suturing technique because I feel this suture um, does a couple of things. It adapts your graft well to the implant, and so there's not really much dead space in there. And at the same time, it uh, coronally advances everything very well. So you see the nylon stitches are holding the graft in, in position, and the PTFE stitches are pulling both the graft and the papillae down. This is how it looks post-op. Um, here you can see the clusal and the frontal views. And we can compare uh, pre and post-op. This is uh, the pre uh, frontal view and the post. So we actually were able to cover just a little bit of the recession here. Um, but when we look at the next slide, and this is really the, the main issue here, uh, we were able to augment thickness. And that's what's going to uh, give this implant resistance to future recession and future disease. This is the important part here. And so this was my last case. Um, I'm going to end this presentation with just a few, not really conclusions, but a, a few um, words about everything that I've discussed today. Well, as you've seen from all the cases I've presented, um, I only pretty much use autogenous tissue uh, when working around implants. I feel that autogenous tissue is um, very dependable. And even, even working on teeth, I would say that I use maybe ADM um, in 20% of my root coverage cases, but when it comes to implants, it's only autogenous tissue. And so it's very important uh, to look at the diagnostics, okay? Very important to look at the soft tissues that we're dealing with and decide what's missing, and we do that at two points in time. The initial uh, appointment before we even do anything with the case, and even more importantly at the second stage surgery uh, appointment. This is where we really need to pay attention to the soft tissue conditions. And based on what we find, we pick a technique of choice that can establish the goals that we're looking for. We have to know what we're trying to achieve. Are we trying to graft thickness? Are we trying to add quality? Are we trying to increase vestibular depth? And that's what's going to guide us into choosing the correct technique. And with that, I'd just like to make one final announcement. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for quite some time. 
and uh, it's going to be available online in about one week. Um, this is a soft tissue management for implant course and really what I love about that course is that every technique that we perform is outlined in this course uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion. And uh, again, this is going to be available in one week through Teachable and I hope that um, you guys can have time to check it out. And with that, uh, these are just some photos uh, from my favorite meeting and I'm sure a lot of yours' favorite meeting, which is Dental XP. Uh, you know, we were just there this past February and hopefully this is all going to be over very soon and we're going to be back in those meetings, uh, interacting, discussing, and just having fun all together. I thank everyone for your kind attention and it's been a true pleasure.